All right, everyone. I am here with Kai Fu Lee. Kai Fu is chairman and CEO of Cinovation Ventures, the former president of Google China, and author of the New York Times bestseller, AI Superpowers. And we're here to talk about his new book, which will be released next week, AI 2041. Kai Fu, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Sam. It is great to have an opportunity to speak with you. I'm looking forward to digging in and talking more about the book. Uh, before we do, though, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and uh, how you came to work in the field of AI. Uh, sure. Uh, I started uh, with my excitement in AI back in 1979 when I started my undergraduate at Columbia. And um, I worked on natural language and vision at uh, Columbia. And then I went to Carnegie Mellon for my PhD, on which I, at, at which I uh, developed the, uh, the first speaker independent speech recognition system uh, based on machine learning, actually. Uh, one of the earlier theses um, in, uh, in um, machine learning in 1988. Uh, I also developed the, a, a computer program that beat the world's Othello champion. It was all in the 80s, very early years. Uh, after uh, my graduation from uh, CMU, I taught there for two years. Then I joined Apple and led uh, a lot of Apple's uh, AI, speech, natural language, um, and multimedia efforts. Uh, later, I joined SGI um, and then Microsoft, where I started the Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing in uh, 1998, which kind of became one of the best um, AI research labs in Asia. Uh, later, I uh, joined Google and ran Google China for four years uh, between 2005 and 2009. Uh, we did do a little bit uh, work on AI, but mostly it was um, really developing uh, Google's presence in China. In 2009, I left Google and started my venture capital firm, uh, Sinovation Ventures. And at San Innovation Ventures, uh, we invest in about 40 AI companies. We were, about the er we were about the earliest and probably invested in the most uh, companies. In, uh, we invested in about seven unicorns in AI alone and with a few more um, yet to come. So uh, very excited to be in the era of AI. Uh, it um, uh, was not so hot during much of my career but uh -huh. I'm glad to be able to catch the uh, recent wave and participate in it. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, so let's maybe jump into the book. The title is AI 2041. Uh, if you just read that, having heard nothing of the book, you might think that it's uh, kind of a straight up, you know, your vision for AI in 2041, but, and, and to some degree, that is the case. You're asking interesting questions on that time horizon, but there's a little bit of a twist. Uh, tell yeah. us about that twist and the way the book is, you know, organized. Uh, sure. The twist is, uh, we, I call this book scientific fiction because <laughs> I collaborated with a science fiction writer who wrote most of the book, probably three quarters. And there are 10 stories. We call it 10 visions of the future. Uh, I find that uh, the impact of AI is um, misunderstood by a lot of people. Uh, some are too conservative, others are too optimistic, and others are just uh, naive, and, um, uh, and some explanation I think would be helpful. AI will change our future, and more people need to understand it. And having a, a fictional writer write it in terms of stories will make it all the more accessible to people. So the book is organized in 10 stories, each of which takes a place in a different country and in a different industry. So we can see how AI will impact all countries and all industries. And then after each story, I write an analysis of the technologies embedded in the chapter, um, how they will progress and uh, what challenges they may bring uh, and how we might solve them or what we, we should do now to deal with the externalities or potential challenges that uh, they bring about. So it's uh, 10, 10 stories going from relatively uh, uh, simple uses of AI to extremely uh, uh, challenging and somewhat futuristic uses of AI. But in the whole set of 10 stories, I try to uh, at least have a high degree of confidence, like 80% or more, 
that this would work in the 10 to 20 year uh, time frame. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned that when you talk to people, you get a range of uh, reactions or perspectives on AI ranging from very conservative to over optimistic. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the, the time horizon that you're you're thinking about. Uh, you chose 20 years as the kind of central time horizon for this book. Why is that? Uh, because on the one hand, 20 years is pretty long. A lot can happen in 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't have the iPhone or the mobile internet. And, and ha- look how things have changed. So imagine 20 years ago, if someone were to write um, AI 2021, um, it would be pretty interesting and fantastic 20 years ago. Um, if, if it accurately described today. So it's uh, long enough, futuristic enough, exciting enough, uh, but not so long that we could hand wave and uh, say, you know, uh, brain download is possible and uh, we become cyborgs or we, we're doing <laughs> teleportation or time travel. So we, we stay away from that. So, uh, and uh-huh. also we, I factor in the, the time it takes to develop the research, to perfect it, to reduce the cost, to implement it, to productize it, uh, to make it acceptable to the market, and and also to deal with potential uh, legal, regula- regulatory, um, and um, uh, accountability uh, uh, issues. So so it's not so some of the stories may look like, hey, we could almost do that today, uh, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of uh, other issues that that will come into play. Sure, sure. I think one of the things that challenges folks the most on this, uh, you know, conservative, optimistic, uh, from a, a, a mass perspective is autonomous driving. Do you have a story in the book that talks about autonomous driving? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Can't uh, write a book in 20 years without it. Uh, of course, by then, L5 will have worked. Um, uh, it's kind of in transition. So I think that describes my view is that um, L5 is uh, quite challenging, and um, the path towards L5, uh, as I describe uh, in the story, will be incremental. Uh, as we know, AI gets better with more deployment, with more data, with more learning. So um, basically, L5 will be a series of uh, increasingly more challenging environments, perhaps starting with uh, fixed routes like uh, buses and then trucks on highways, uh, and then more and more cities. And that's kind of one path um, as more data experience is gathered. Uh, It will face um, still a lot of um, challenges even in 20 years. And one of the predictions I make is that uh, cities will have to modify some existing road infrastructure. Uh, For example, to separate very dangerous cross sections with pedestrians and cars so that uh, there's no risk of a car hitting a pedestrian in the most likely uh, environments and crossroads in downtowns, uh, such as uh, happened with the Uber autonomous vehicle in, in, in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and also roads can be smart and essentially work symbiotically with uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, and also I predict that there will still be environments in which AI will be lost and need a need a backup driver. Yet we will need cars that are have no steering wheel and uh, really no place for a driver, so they can be small, smaller, nimbler, talk to each other, and um, uh, even avoiding um, accidents as they communicate their location and speed. And if you have a blown tire, you will tell cars around you. So I envision all of these uh, will happen. But one part of it that might my partner Stanley, who wrote the science fiction stories, thought was interesting was what would be the life of a backup driver um, in that case? Uh, because mm-hmm. if the car got into a natural disaster where the roads have disappeared and you have to fall back on natural instincts of a human driver to survive and navigate out of a incredibly dangerous zone, uh, it obviously the passenger couldn't do it. There's no longer a steering wheel. So the solution would have to be a remote center where super drivers jump in from one disaster to another, uh, saving people's lives. And then the other interesting dramatic element is, well, what happens to the life of such a backup driver? Would it create so much stress 
uh, that you know they can't live with themselves because they will be you know watching people die from day to day, and um, so how would such an arrangement be made? So without giving away the story, that's kind of the dramatic element and the technical element weaved into a story. Mm -hmm. uh, that last note about the drivers and their welfare and their life, even though we're talking about a scenario 20 years from now, that calls to mind the lives of folks that are working in like content moderation farms uh, and centers today that are dealing with those kinds of issues. Um, so uh, I imagine that uh, part of what you're trying to do is to, you know, point to future issues, but also uh, tie them to contemporary issues as well. Uh, and also there are other interesting dramatic elements. Um, for example, um, how do you recruit such a amazing um, drivers? So, so part of the story is uh, games are developed and then winners of these games, sometimes teenagers, uh, would be approached to see if they would be a backup driver. But of course, that's too much psychological um, uh, burden for a young uh, teenager to be put into the position of helping and saving lives. So uh, is it a morally a problem to package a real job saving people's lives as a game and not disclose it to the teenager who happens to be the best backup driver that one can find. So we're saving lives, good purpose, but can you lie to a teenager who's uh, known to be saving lives, but also not fair to put the psychological burden for them to know they're saving and, and, and not saving lives every day. Um, and uh, do you tell them or don't you tell them? It's a moral uh, dilemma. Uh, and do you do you answer those questions or do you just raise them? <laughs> we uh, we just raise them, but I think the endings of the stories uh, would give away how we feel. Uh, but mm. but we don't want to. But but I think it's an issue where reasonable people can and will disagree. So we don't presume that we know the right answer. But sure. I think we need to be aware such challenges will come up, and and the book is probably. Uh, uh, for the people watching this podcast, the book is less about learning about technologies because you probably know most of what I have to say, but, but thinking ahead about the externalities and implications that are up ahead and what we technologists can possibly do about it to educate people and also to develop solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, one more question on the autonomous uh, driving scenario. You mentioned that you fully expect and that the story presumes level five autonomy is uh, in existence in 20 years. Does the, the book or your analysis uh, project a degree of deployment or uh, the, the degree to which it is uh, in use at that time? Uh, yes, yes. I think the presumption is that um, in developed countries, it's already popularly in use. And in countries that are uh, proactively changing its transportation ecosystem, it gets deployed earlier. And that's part of the technological prediction and hypothesis. It's also predicting that um, developing countries and underdeveloped countries would need the help of developed countries. Uh, to put this technology into place. So this um, story takes place in Sri Lanka. And in the story, Sri Lanka gets help from a tech Chinese technological company that is um, building a business out of helping developed countries move um, from, uh, from not having autonomous to autonomous. And, and I think part of the Im implication is that large countries will continue to have more advanced AI to put into other countries. And another assumption is the world will move towards autonomy uh, one tier at a time. And that I feel uh, first tier of countries may have it in the you know 15 year time frame, um, mm -hmm. with other countries coming later 20 years plus. And Sri Lanka was chosen at the place because uh, not all the roads are yet um, quite ready for autonomy with mm -hmm. some very uh, backward um, environments. Uh, because it would not be reasonable to put that scenario in U.S. or China, where 
by then, I think the infrastructure as well as the technology uh, would perhaps um, have a very a more minimal use of backup drivers by uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's hard to talk about AI in the future without raising the question of jobs and job displacement. It's probably one of the uh, you know, issue of one of the issues, issues around which there's the most concern when talking about the future uh, use of AI. Um, do you take that up in you know one particular story in the book, or is this an, uh, something that cuts across various stories? Uh, it cuts across um, all the stories. Uh, there are probably three stories um, in which uh, this uh, covers. Um, the, the one that's squarely on the topic is a story called The Job Savior. And it's a story um, that takes place uh, in the U.S. Uh, by watching um, phases and phases of routine jobs being taken over by AI. A new profession uh, uh, arises called a job reallocator. And it's a company that would be funded either out of uh, government funding um, Instead of paying Social Security or universal basic income, the company would take, out, take the funding and basically solve the problem of retraining and redeploying workers whose jobs are being displaced by AI. And, and this company faces some significant challenges. One is that uh, AI is improving capability, so more and more routine jobs are being lost. People are being retrained, but three years later, losing job again. Another major challenge that it faces uh, is that many entry jobs are being hollowed out because AI can do jobs of an entry-level accountant, entry-level architect, entry-level reporter. But how do you advance people's careers and maintain their motivation to grow and learn without having entry-level jobs? So mm -hmm. it um, brings up the possibility of creating a virtual job in which the person thinks he or she is working, but perhaps is only training. It's more like a training wheels, not creating value to the economy, but the training will, will help point out people's individual talents so they can be read out, redirected later. So again, a potentially a moral question of, is it okay to let people work on jobs which are not real or maybe are real, but could be done by AI? And then how would the job reallocator deal with these challenges? So that's the more direct one. Uh, there is another, another one on education, is how would AI be evolved so that it helps young people uh, um, hone their soft skills, um, skills like uh, communication, teamwork, um, and human-to-human -human interaction, as well as train their creativity and critical thinking which become all the more important because those are the skills AI cannot replace and, and also find the voice of each individual person. Uh, so that's kind of related to uh, routine jobs being displaced. So people either have to find something AI cannot do or do things that only humans can do or find something the individual is good at. So that's another story. Uh, a third story has to do with human motivation. Um, it's, it's more of a utopian outcome where uh, so much money is being generated in an era of plenitude, uh, where uh, not only does AI do our much of the routine work for us, but also the energy costs have come down with green energy, new materials, the cost of goods are reduced, and the meaning of money needs to evolve. So it asks the question, uh, the work isn't, the work and money isn't just a, um, something to keep us busy, but it's kind of uh, people's uh, motivation and, and um, um, reason for living. So if jobs are largely gone, uh, routine jobs are largely gone, uh, how do people remain motivated? So I think it pushes the question into why do we live in this world? Uh, perhaps it isn't just for work and pay, but also for, um, for um, self-actualization, finding what our lives are about, and um, uh, can those be, be measured somehow? Can AI somehow measure uh, whether we are uh, improving ourselves, where, where we're happily growing, where we're uh, finding 
um, uh, where we're creating more positive energy. Because as you move up the Maslow hierarchy, um, it's not just about subsistence and um, not just about um, uh, money for security, but also about uh, love and empathy and um, um, companionship. So can those things be measured? And can people have some kind of metric to improve um, a different metric than money and a different um, metric by job by spending their time uh, perhaps in uh, sustainability, volunteer jobs, um, companionship, mm -hmm. uh, as well as all the creative professional jobs. And it's an exploration of how that could develop in, uh, in a market, uh, in a country, uh, in this case, Australia, uh, which is okay. doing a pretty good job in, uh, in, in energy, uh, efficient energy that it might mm -hmm. create enough of uh, a, a small enough population uh, to create uh, and a lot of natural resources to create a, the first um, science, uh, the first economy of where universal basic income, plenitude and uh, moving people to higher purpose might be explored as an experiment. Kind of the gamification of life purpose in a sense. That's right. I mean, our life is a gamification now. I mean, money is a virtual, it's a silly virtual um, tool that keeps us, you know, um, in the rat race uh, when it's, it's um, you know, it's a fabricated human story. And, and we're playing a big game now in chasing uh, fame and, and wealth. So I think we need to find another, which is perhaps uh, more motivating. It's interesting you hearing you talk about these these stories and reflecting on the other ones. The book kind of walks this line between uh you know presenting these potentially dystopic scenarios uh kind of like black mirror esque but um you know trying to pull out i think trying to pull out an optimistic note uh in yeah. the, for the most part you know to talk more about your your broad perspective uh on on the book are you you know are you kind of going into these stories looking specifically for the the optimistic ending or um you know does it vary do you have kind of different takes on where we'll go for different scenarios uh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Black Mirror, and uh, if um, you know, if, if the book reviews would find this book to be similar to be, be Black Mirror but more positive, uh, I uh, there's nothing that would be, <laughs> please me more. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think the Black Mirror does a great job uh, describing possible dangers, and they usually end up with um, uh, bad endings, <laughs> sometimes yeah. good ending. Uh, so this so this is our effort to try to also describe the challenges that could arise. And, and but also I want to go an extra step to say there could be a solution if only, right? If only we educated our kids differently, if only we uh, regulated large companies in particular ways, if only uh, we thought ahead about job displacement and provide the training, if we deeply understand the meaning of uh, money and how we can gradually move towards a substitute so, uh, and, and I think probably uh, six stories or so have a happy ending, and then three have an ambiguous ending, and one has a somewhat bad ending. So I'm, I'm not uh, being naive to say all the problems will be hand waved away and solved. So yeah. clearly there are challenges, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there's, there are challenges with both the dystopic ending and the the utopian ending the optimistic ending and i think you almost want to you know not quite a, a choose your own adventure type of a story but a, a story that you know where there's a branch that says what the the dystopic ending could look like and what are some of the mm. levers that could put you in down that path, uh, and also mm -hmm. presents the optimistic ending and, you know, what are some of the levers that would kind of drive society towards a, an optimistic, uh, perspective. Do you, do you take on any of that in your analysis of the, the various scenarios? Uh, I, I do. So, so in the chapter about autonomous weapons, it's a story, um, it's a, it's an issue that I think a lot of people in the AI community. Uh, feel 
the same way that the physics community felt about nuclear weapons and the chemistry um, community felt about chemical weapons and so on. Uh, so it is um, the, the, the clearest um, challenge that we face today because the cost of making an autonomous drone with face rec recognition that can kill an individual as an automated assassin, uh, that has so many dangers because it lowers the cost of the t for the terrorists without having to risk the terrorists' lives. Uh, and also, it's very hard to, to regulate because it's uh, not like nuclear weapons. There, the, the good and bad thing about nuclear weapons is there is a principle of uh, assured mutual destruction. So people have a deterrent. Countries don't do it because they're afraid of retaliation and mutual destruction. But that isn't the case with autonomous weapons. Um, so so that one of the stories is about a uh, terrorist uh, modeled after the uh, Una bom bomber. Um, and who decided to take revenge on a particular uh, group of people, in this case, the elites of the world, uh, as is modeled after the, the, the Unabomber. So, um, Unabom Unabomber, sorry. Um, so, um, so, the story ends up with um, uh, challenges of what happens when autonomous weapons are not regulated, and the outcome is. Uh, uh, a somewhat negative one, and the world isn't destroyed, but it's still a somewhat negative one. He gets away with something, of course, um, and and um, uh, of course he's caught, but he creates causes a lot of damage. So, uh, in the um, explanation section, um, I go into detail explaining uh, the additional challenges of autonomous weapons compared to conventional weapons, compared to you know. Um, uh, as well as to nuclear weapons and why uh, they really have to be regulated and what happens when you don't regulate it. Um, and, and then I point out the challenges of regulating it because unlike nuclear weapons, you can't have UN uh, go into a country and inspect um, uranium or uh, nuclear facilities because someone can build this in their garage. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. regulation must take place. And I point out a few possible ways of regulating it. Um, as well as um, most AI scientists believe that it should be uh, regulated. Several letters have been written. Um, and, and, and also uh, the consequences of uh, not, not regulating it. So, so I think that describes uh, the bo both possible paths of um, a negative outcome. And, and that's an example where uh, uh, both paths are, are explored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a, a section like that, where you're talking about uh, something that's uh, you know very clear uh, and, and present danger, do you is there a concrete call to action for folks? Is that part of your perspective here to tell folks how to um, you know if this is the issue yeah. that they're most passionate about? Where do they go? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, it's not a direct call to action, but I think uh -huh. it uh, hopefully removes all ambiguity. Uh, arguments have been made that autonomous weapons are in the early phases of uh, development, so it's too early to regulate them. And I give counterexample on why that isn't the case. And also there are uh, huge issues about how difficult it is to regulate it. But I also point out that we, uh, mankind, have managed to largely control and contain chemical weapons and biological weapons, which are potentially uh, equally difficult to, uh, to track and regulate. So if we can do those, uh, we should be able to do this one. So I think people can draw their own conclusions. Um, some are probably perhaps still not convinced by the argument, but I wanted to, uh, to make the argument. Mm -hmm. I, I've often had these exchanges with folks where... Um you know, they kind of present this scenario of, uh, you know, conscious AI that is uh, belligerent in some way, kind of like Terminator uh, type of example. Um, and, uh, you know, or like, uh, you know, a Nick Bostrom super intelligence that's potentially, you know, dangerous. And, uh, you know, I often will say, you know, I, that is something that is potentially out there in the future, but, you know, autonomous weapons are much more kind of clear and, uh, and, and closer and, and concrete and, um, 
scary for me personally than, you know, some AI that's, you know, acting on its own against uh, human interest. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Uh, that's why by absence, uh, there is no singularity story in the book. There mm -hmm. is no AI with self-consciousness, self-awareness uh, that tries to destroy the human race in the story. So by, by its absence, um, I'm totally agreeing with that. Um, in the analysis section, I do bring up the issue of singularity, of why I don't rule out its possibility in the future, but I think it's too simplistic to say the exponential growth of um, compute power also means an exponential growth that will uh, drop the people behind. In many of the stories, we still see many parts of the human intelligence that cannot be replicated by AI. Uh, the fact that m m many stories are saved by the de saved by the hero or heroine of the story because of their uh, emotional um, and beliefs and conviction and love. And that's something unique to people. And, uh, and also uh, in stories where there are villains who do terrible things, they're the ones who cause the disaster using AI as a tool. AI never in these 10 stories become the villain in itself. And, and, and then I, I clearly explain that uh, singularity could happen when breakthroughs in algorithms enable a full take, fully taking advantage of the exponential growth. But today, we still have not had breakthroughs that understand how our brain works, uh, why we have self-awareness and emotion and creativity and can do analysis and strategic thinking. So to think we can replicate AI on something that we don't even know how we do it, nor do we see AI approaching it, uh, and we know AI do not possess it, so we, we don't have to worry about uh, extrapolating the exponential curve and seeing superintelligence and or singularity within the next 20 years. Uh, that said, I do believe the set of things that AI can do better than human will grow uh, dramatically. And AI will do many things that humans cannot imagine to do, but there will always be a set that is about our core humanity, uh, at least in a 20 year time frame that we can hold on to. And it's exactly that set that defines our humanity, that causes our uh, the stories, the people in the stories to shine and save the day. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the exponential growth in compute, one of the stories touches on quantum computing. Uh, what's your take on where that is in 20 years and the, the degree to which it enables uh, a more powerful artificial intelligence? Uh, yeah, I think quantum is one of the um, areas where I needed to make a not 100% confident um, <laughs> prediction, right? Because there's too, too much variance and, <laughs> and variability. Uh, but, but I do think looking at the maps that IBM, Google, and other companies have, and the progress that's been made, particularly in the last two years, it seems like we can extrapolate um, a story where the uh, improvements in uh, logical qubits uh, will reach uh, thousands, uh, probably less than 20 years. There are a lot of issues of how do you maintain stability and how many physical qubits do you need to support logical, a few thousand logical qubits. So um, I, I'm not an expert in the area, but the experts seem to agree. Several thousand qubits are possible and there are useful uh, applications um, by that time with the major one being um, in security. That is the existing asymmetrical cryptography algorithms um, will no longer work. Uh, the flip side of that is um, quantum computing will provide a new unbreakable uh, security uh, system. So in the story, I did not go into how quantum and AI work together because at a few thousand qubits, I don't think it's enough to disrupt AI completely yet. So mm -hmm. 20 years would be about when uh, the security um, uh, challenges would come up. So in one of the stories, uh, the villain uh, achieved 4,000 qubits uh, without anyone else knowing it. And the villain went after uh, stealing bitcoins, which is the one mm -hmm. commonly uh, described uh, uh, the largest bank that's waiting to be robbed. So mm -hmm. that was a part of the story. Uh, but in the analysis, I do go into 
the uh, very nature of quantum that can hold uncertainty in its head and pursue paths in parallel and dramatically reducing the MP complete search problem uh, will lead to a day where AI algorithms will be uh, disrupted. Um, but I don't think 20 years is quite when that will happen. It will probably mm -hmm. take longer with more than 4,000 qubits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the book, uh, of course, is focused on this 20 year, you know, 20 year forward time horizon, but there are a lot of AI technologies around which there are very contemporary issues in the realm of uh, ethics, bias, and others. Computer vision is one that comes to mind. Facial recognition in particular, uh, it's a very contemporary issue. The use of facial recognition uh, by uh, police uh, organizations, the proliferation of cameras uh, in, you know, quote unquote, smart cities. Um, you know, a lot of people look at the, you know, it would be easy to look at the situation now and the, the frustration that many people have with the situation now and find it difficult to project forward 20 years. Do you do that in the book? I, I do not. Facial recognition is one I did not speculate because um, we're in a bifurcated world. Um, some countries are attempting to regulate it, others are not. And um, it's, it's not clear a bifurcated world can work. Hopefully we'll reach a uh, universal consensus at, at some point. Um, I, I do go into many other aspects of externalities, and I, I guess you can extrapolate from them to, uh, to, to, to all of the possibilities. So for example, I talk about um, how objective functions need to be improved to go from maniacally focusing on something like click-throughs and um, uh, revenue generating, moving into longer term metrics. Um, so our social media in 20 years ought to be showing us content that is making us better over time, um, that, that we feel we're seeing content that is time well spent, as Tristan Harris would say, or we're seeing content that is making us improving in some metric. Maybe it's our wealth, maybe it's our happiness, maybe it's our uh, how much knowledge we've gained, and whether AI objective functions can be turned more long-term and more aligned with humans. That's one aspect I explored, and I think technologists um, should spend more time on topics like that. Another is on bias and fairness. Um, can we um, ensure that, have tools that ensure that um, AI is being trained on reasonably balanced um, data so that it's not discriminating against any uh, race, gender, individual, et cetera. Um, and, and also um, can, can compilers uh, alert warnings uh, right now, can AI tools do the same? And also can AI engineers be trained to be aware of the substantial power that they control and therefore the responsibilities that must come with it. So that's another aspect. Uh, another one related to privacy and, uh, and, and having our cake and eat it too. Can we have AI trained on a lot of data, but not everybody giving away data privately without consent? So mm -hmm. the stories in the book talks about how technologies like federated uh, learning, um, homomorphic encryptions, um, and also uh, hardware environments um, that are um, self-contained, where where data does not leak, can these te these technologies I predict in 20 years will be able to let us have our cake and eat it too, so that our data stays in devices to which we uh, permit, say our phone, our computer, or uh, the computers at the hospital which has our data, but not beyond that. So the models um, from a hospital is trained on all the patients in that hospital who license their data to the uh, hospital, but not beyond. Then the hospitals can jointly train by sh uh, pooling their models together. So, so in the book, I point out the technological areas that I think are promising and the possible technological solutions that could end up addressing many of the problems we see. And I think the call to action is for the technologists who read the book and who watch the podcast to think about 
whether, what, rather than doing research on the next deep learning or tweaking a particular model, uh, mm -hmm. is it useful for a sufficient percentage of the AI community to think about these technological solutions that solve the problems caused by uh, our technology, AI. Mm -hmm. uh, on that note, there are a number of labs focused on uh, AI safety as a, a research focus. You know, often they take the perspective of you know, trying to prevent the Terminator scenario or making sure that we can control the Terminator scenario. Um, do you have a perspective on, on those efforts? Are they asking the right questions, looking at the right things? Well, there are risks that are uh, clear and present danger. I think those ought to be addressed by the largest number of people, issues related to um, bias, fairness, um, how to have our cake and eat it too with respect to personal data. Um, there are uh, longer term, lower likelihood um, existential questions that one could ask. And I think it makes perfect sense for a small number of uh, people in more like a think tank than a technology development uh, to uh, basically watch for that possibility and to alert for the rest of us. So yes, I do think those labs should continue to do what they do. I don't think those existential threats will happen in the next 20 years, but I, I, I think we, we should have think tanks that think about them and tell us when we really do need to get um, involved and worried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the chapter on autonomous weapons, you call for uh, regulation. Uh, you mention the objective function and you know there are many contemporary calls for regulation of internet companies uh, and uh, advertising methods and, and you know privacy and, and many other things uh, for internet companies but how do you see regulation evolving over the next 20 years yeah um, I, th I think in the US people talk the most about breaking up companies I think that is uh, too brute force and too, um, um, you know, twentieth century. It's mm -hmm. not something designed for this kind of uh, monopoly. Uh, I do think regulations are needed, but I think we need to come up with n newer and better uh, regulations. And why uh, do you think that's example, ineffective for modern companies? Well, let's say um, Facebook got broken up into WhatsApp.com uh, and Instagram.com and Facebook.com. It doesn't stop any of it. It wouldn't have stopped the Cambridge Analytica issue, right? It wouldn't stop any one of the three products doing things that we don't want them to do. Uh, it would reduce it, but it's, it's too brute force. It was specifically addressing monopoly extension um, by, you know, Standard Oil moving into gas, um, gas, into a, um, yeah, um, gas stations and stop, um, uh, yeah, and, and having the big bell company break broken up into baby bells. Um, I think those were perhaps appropriate for telecommunications or traditional industries. But I think the, the, the issue that is fundamental is um, uh, it, it's, I, I think people, the reason people go into such extreme measures is they've given up hope that some companies can self-manage. Uh, I've not given up hope, but I don't think today's um, uh, reward and punishment systems uh, give the large companies any incentive to self-manage and those need to be created. Uh, for example, I think an idea called the AI audit is something that could be pursued, right? It's very clear that the government can't go in and, and look at the code and data for each of the uh, large internet companies. But when there are sufficiently serious complaints and repetitions of cons complaints, there can be an audit, just like there can be a financial audit or a tax audit. So with that as a deterrent, I think companies can be better behaved. Of course, what are the metrics? How does a complaint count? Uh, should the government get to look at the data in a large company? These are all issues that need to be solved. But it seems more, uh, I think, a more plausible way than just breaking up companies and more effective. Um, another, uh, I think ultimately we need to... Um, 
get companies to really have aligned financial uh, incentives so that if they better behave. For example, can there be a third party watchdog that publishes how much fake news, how much you know, false uh, advertising, how much wrong search results or whatever things we have. If we have mm -hmm. a third party watchdog that publishes those and um, enough consumer advocacy and uh, uh, corporate ESG pressure for the companies to feel like every quarter they have to report not just the financial results, but how they do on the, uh, you know, a fake news me metric, fake mm -hmm. news ranking, then they're going to form internal teams because they're being monitor from the outside. So that would be one example. But the ideally, um, we, we want to somehow uh, have companies that can make even more money by aligning themselves with user needs. So as users become happier or learn more information or um, become wealthier or whatever those metrics, um, and, and it can somehow be attributed to companies that have created or helped enable that situation, um, then it it can make more it, it can even make even more money. So 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 in other words, are we willing to pay a company a lot more money to make us um, more knowledgeable, wealthier, or happier uh, in a three year horizon compared to uh, the money that the company would make on us clicking and buying things? So uh, looking at um, natural, uh, financially uh, aligned metrics that connect the user and the, the company. This is a little bit abstract at right now. But, I was going to ask, uh, do you suggest any such metrics in the book? I suspect the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, it's, it's just like, you know, 30 years ago, would people have come up with the ways that, you know, Facebook does advertising or Google yeah. does uh, AdWords or AdSense. Some, some smart entrepreneur uh, will come up with some system that will create a new, a new ecosystem uh, that will uh, um, um, create a new set of companies that are even more profitable than Google and Facebook. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know the answer, but entrepreneurs and VCs can take a step back and think about it. It's not so much out of the question, right? Because uh, how do we, how do we measure people's happiness? Well, there are many metrics that can be used on our facial expressions, micro expressions, um, measures of our hormones, um, uh, endorphin, etc. Uh, that could be one beginning of such a way. Um, our our wealth can be measured over time, um, and um, whether we've learned something and grown. I think just like you know, GPT three today can remember millions of words that it's read and pick out the ones that are relevant for the given current context, perhaps there will be AI that can look at all of our time spent on the internet and pick out the epiphany moments that have caused us to grow. And, and, and those moments, if there is a software technology or objective function that enable the moment, they should be properly um, compensated for it. So I don't think it's out of the question. Um, the technologies can be developed, but I don't know what the model is. If I did, I'd be uh, either funding or creating that company myself. Uh, I was just going to ask, was that part of your motivation for writing the book to kind of signal to entrepreneurs that, hey, these are areas that need to be explored. And if you are working in these areas, hey, reach out to, uh, reach out to me. That's not the primary purpose, but um, <laughs> if that were a side effect, I would be happy to uh, look at those business plans. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Kaifu, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us and share a bit about the book. Congratulations uh, on the book. It is uh, really takes an interesting approach at raising uh, some very important questions in the development of AI. So thanks and, and congrats once again on that. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, for having me.